So it's a pleasure to have a good turnout today. We've been thinking about this for some time as, as an exercise in providing a platform for discussion about the Northwest Relief Road. We originally were going to have this recorded by the BBC Midland today, but because of the horrible incident in London, their camera crew has been asked to go to Stafford. But we do have, very luckily, a gentleman in the back there who is video recording this for the Civic Society, for the website and so on. So I'm, I'm assuming everyone is happy with having the back of their heads pictured. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not, please let me know. Okay, well, I need to say, um, and towards the, towards the latter part of this afternoon, we'll be finishing around four o'clock, I hope, anyway. Originally, it was going to be longer, I'll explain why. There are leaflets on the chairs. They are some of them are from ourselves as a civic society, that's our membership obviously. And as I often say to people, the strength of our voice in, in planning in a planning context is related to the number of our uh, members. We are a growing organization, very powerful in town, so it helps if uh, you're not already a member, then you do join. Our membership secretary, Bibbs Cameron is sitting at the table waiting for any new members to come along. Okay, right, well I need also to say that uh, at the, towards the end we will have an opportunity for you to ask questions and we also have an opportunity for you to have written questions which we'll put to the council. We can't guarantee of course the council will reply or they will reply in a meaningful way but anyway we'll see. <laughs> Okay, well, I need to explain as well. The Civic Society, about a year ago now, we were talking about, about my committee was talking about having an event primarily for our members. And we got nearly 200 members, and we were thinking of organising an event about the North West Relief Road. So I spoke <coughs> to the council. I was thinking, well, we should have arguments for, arguments against. And I was thinking about five aside. Five speakers for, five against. And at the beginning, in September, when I spoke to the, um, some of the people there, including the leader of the council, they seemed happy to come along. I explained it was an open public meeting, so that they could look at the arguments for and against. And I thought that was sensible, and the civic society tries to be even-handed. Anyway, so they were fine, or appeared to be, and in October, they changed their minds. And they said it was due to the possibility of planning predetermination because of course they will be they are the planning authority and they will have to approve the planning application for the relief road. But as I said, well I mean when you propose the relief road and obtain the money to the business case and so on, you knew you were the planning authority, surely. So it can't be argued it's predetermined anyway. So so we haven't got any speakers from the council in speaking in favour of the road. Uh, but I can read some of the <coughs> comments that have been made by some of the external people in favour. Um, so I was sorry that it's not quite as even-handed as we would have liked, because I take the view really that if you've got an organisation proposing something on this scale, uh, which, is, which has attracted £54 million worth of public money, then the least they can do is to come along and explain why they're proposing it. Anyway, so, so they're not uh, officially here, but if there is anyone who would like to speak from the floor on behalf of the council, or criticising the council, that's fine. <laughs> that's good. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll pick up. I say we, we'll be finishing about four o'clock, and um, oh, so we, we, have we do have one speaker who's... Yes, we have one speaker. Yes, I know that. Yes, and I'll be reading. I'll be reading some of the the observations as well from other other people and from the uh, LEP Local Enterprise Partnership. And of course, the Department of Transport has approved the 54 million as well. So uh, I phoned various people to see if they would come along and speak in favour. But we've very luckily uh, got Andrew Evans coming to speak, and he's from Shrewsbury Business Chamber. Right under the business chamber, yeah. So, okay, right, well, we kick off then. Our first, oh, I need to introduce as well 
uh, my colleague, Jordanis Petridis, who's the chairman of our access group. I'm chairman of the civic society as a whole. Jordanis is chairman of the access group. Do you want to say what that does? You can speak into this if you wish. You do it after me. Okay. Okay, well, do you want to come out then? Because we want to, <laughs> <laughs> want to get to it. Should we take a vote? No vote says yes. On the general election, this is, don't worry. Okay. <clears throat> All right. The Access Group. This is a small group dealing with the, anything that has to do with the accessibility and circulation to the town centre as well as the rest of the town. Uh, also for pedestrians and vehicles. So that's the general idea. Uh, as a group, we support, of course, and follow the targets and the aims of the civic society, which is to protect the heritage and the general, more general terms, to improve life for the town. Some of our recent issues uh, were the question of the 20 miles per hour limits. The so-called SITP project has proposed to improve the existing limitation of the speed limits in the town centre, the 20 mile, has proposed to include part of Smithfield Road, but only up from the Welsh Bridge up to where it meets the Marlborough, which seems a bit <laughs> inappropriate and inadequate. So we send our comments there, suggesting that not only the whole of Smithfield Road should be included in the limit of 20 miles per hour, but also our three gyratory systems with which we enter the town. The one around the station, the one near the Abbey, and Frankwell roundabout. All these areas should be included in the... I mean, it's, it's common sense, there's no big wisdom there. Uh, we haven't heard from them. I haven't finished. <laughs> <laughs> You've still got another three hours to speak. <laughs> okay. Now, the, our interest in the Northwest Relief Road are two. First is what the proposed new road, what effect it will have to the town centre. And then second, which alternative measures could relieve the town from excess traffic pressures, which is suffering. Uh, to that effect, we examined in detail the business case study of the council, and uh, as such, the study finishes with predictions of future flows. Now, these predictions were based on what is known as a, a statistical regression model. Uh, this model is used to calculate future movements, future flows, and uh, this uh, calculation is always based on present number of trips and uh, projects in the future based on the future development of various factors such as population, car ownership and so on. Now, 
because I have been involved in such models uh, personally in the past, uh, I'm familiar and I know very well that the results are only as good as the information we feed them with and the, and the presumptions we put in. So, there are lots of things that have happened since 1917 when the study was uh, done uh, that have changed many of the factors that should have been taken into account. So, we are here, of course, to investigate exactly these items and that, to that, our panel and yourselves will uh, give our opinion and maybe we come to some new conclusions. Before I introduce you to our first speaker, I'd like just to mention that the civic society itself hasn't taken a formal position as yet about the road. We generally uh, uh, look at the planning applications when they're submitted and validated by the planning authority, which is Shropshire Council. So we may in due course be taking a formal position, but at the moment we still have an open mind, which is why we decided to organize this event, so that members of the public, yourselves, also had an opportunity to think about the whole issue in an open way. Anyway, I'll hand you over to our first speaker, Dave Shepherd. Dave. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many people interested in uh, what I insist on calling the Northwest Road. But we'll come to that in a minute. I'm Dave Green. I'm an energy advisor and consultant. Um, I've been a member of Shrewsbury Friends of the Earth for nearly 40 <coughs> years. I've been active on, uh, particularly on the Northwest Road. 25 of those 40 years. Um, um, <coughs> recently, Friends here have joined together with a number of other groups, you can see the names up there on the, on the board, to form an organisation called Better Shrewsbury Transport. And the idea is that, yes, we're very much against the road, but uh, we're also, we think there are better alternatives. So it's, our message is not just, no, we don't want the road, previous group is called the No Way Group, which, which did what it said on the tin, but, well, you know, was a bit negative, really. We're hoping to put a more positive spin, that not only do we not like the road, but we think there are better ways of dealing with Shrewsbury's traffic. Uh, that's, by the way, the bridge, 26 metre high from the road to the, to the river level. Right. Uh, Byron's asked me to say a few words about the route itself. This is the proposed route. This has been fixed for the last 10, maybe 15 years. Before that, there were some various choices of routes. But this is the approved route that they're hoping to build, going from Choco Roundabout, which is the junction of the A5 with the Welshpool Road, up to the, the roundabout at the top of Ellesmere Road at the end of the Battlefield Link Road. Now, this is the Oxen Road end map. Um, a couple of things I'd like to point out. Can you hear me with that microphone? Yeah. Good, good. A uh, couple of things I want to point out. Uh, I'm not making any comment, but just make sure that you're aware that this, this Welshpool Road would be closed here. And the reason for that is the Highways Agency will not allow five major roads onto uh, such a small roundabout. I think there's a couple of houses there that need access. But the, the, uh, there is a roundabout here, and access to the hospice would be off that roundabout. There has been some recent comments by one of the officers involved that they might be removing one of the roundabouts on the route. As far as we can see, that is the only roundabout that they could take out. It goes be, be between the hospice uh, and the uh, park and ride, and it comes out just by the water tower with a roundabout on the Hollyhead Road. 
This is the next section of the road, and uh, it goes uh, just below the uh, Seven Trent uh, obstruction point on the river. This is the bridge, which is uh, which actually is quite long because this is all floodplain, so it needs to come down. Uh, and then it's on an embankment. Uh, this is the sort of showground here, isn't it? It's going above the showground to uh, this is the roundabout on Berwick Road. Uh, and this is the Berwick Road access into town, which will actually become that roundabout will be the the closest point on the whole ring road to the centre of the town. <clears throat> and here, this is the next bit, it's going up. This is um, the vineyard, which I still know as the monkey farm, but uh, <laughs> um, it's the name of this lane, there's a anyway, the vineyard here. Uh, the railway line at that point is quite deep cutting. <laughs> So the, it will go over the railway line, uh, quite close to Hencock Hall, which is an internationally recognised uh, wetland site. Uh, and then it comes out, so this is, north is that way. So this is Ellesmere Road, Battlefield Roundabout. And here we have a similar problem to the one at Churncoat. There are already five roads on that roundabout. So Huffley Lane would have to be diverted. So people coming from Bowmere Heath will not join the roundabout directly. They will have to go up to a T-junction just north of the roundabout, negotiate the T-junction and then the roundabout before they can proceed. Okay. <coughs> now, as I said, I've been working on this scheme for 25 years, and when the funding was announced earlier this year, I did, I did, I must admit I was a little bit upset. Um, but I sat down and I thought, you know, have I got it right? You know, maybe, maybe times have moved on, maybe we do need the road, <clears throat> maybe we don't need to fight against it. And, uh, and, and then I thought, so I, I thought about a few things quite, quite, and then, one of the things I found in, in doing some research was this uh, quote from the Centre for Alternative Technology that says, in almost any vision of zero carbon Britain, there must be a shift from the car to more efficient forms of transport. They suggest a reduction in personal car miles of 40%. Now, Shropshire Council, to their credit, have... Uh, uh, accepted a, a climate emergency. Um, so I would hope that they would take this point seriously. It's not saying that we get rid of the car, it's not saying you can't have a car, it's talking about a reduction uh, in car ownership and car <coughs> usage of around 40%. It's difficult to imagine getting to zero car without. But of course, that's the centre for alternative technology. All the old hippies up in the hill. Of course they'd say that. <laughs> but the House of Commons Select Committee on Transport agrees. Technology alone cannot solve the problem for greenhouse gas emissions from transport. And in the long term, widespread personal transport vehicle ownership does not appear to be compatible with significant decarbonisation. What I've also done is I've had a closer look at the transport figures that are included in the outline business case that uh, Shropshire Council put to the government two years ago. And, um, oh, by the way, Byron did say that we'd have questions at the end, but if there's anything you really don't understand about what I'm saying, then by all means interrupt. Um, so, in this outline business case, they give transport figures. It's a central part of their of their uh, the case for the road is how it deals with transport, as you might expect. And they give three sets of figures. They give the transport levels that they've measured in 2017. Now there's various question marks over that, but if we accept that as a reasonable set of figures, they then give a they postulate 
a set of figures for 2037 on the what's called the do minimum scenario. Do minimum means all they've taken into account are things that are already in the planning process. Um, so an awful lot of things that are, that, you know, things that are coming through the planning process now and in the new local plan will not necessarily be in the do minimum scenario. Yes. Yeah, sorry, can you just say, you asked, uh, thankfully, uh, yeah. to, finally, to explain, to, to, we can ask questions of John Stanton. What is the column on the left, please? The column, the column on the left is the number of trips, it's, it's a indicative of the number of trips made by car and, and vehicles around the town uh, in 2017. It's 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is, this is representative, it's not an actual number of trips, it's representative of the current level of transport around Shrewsbury. Yeah. They've postulated this 2037 do minimum scenario, which, and it varies road by road, but overall it's about 24% higher than the traffic levels in 2017. So let's say if they do nothing, over the next 20 years, traffic levels will go up 24%. <coughs> then, they, they calculate the figures, well, what happens if we build the road? So this third column is 2037 with the road, by their, by their um, calculations. Yep. Now, it gets a bit complicated because they don't do this for the whole town, they do it road by road. And these are the figures I've worked through, through an Excel spreadsheet that goes to several pages. Now, so whenever they quote, whenever you hear somebody from the council saying there will be a traffic reduction of 30% on Smithfield Road, they're not talking about compared to current levels, they're talking about compared to the do minimum scenario of 2037. <coughs> this is accepted practice. I'm not denying that. But when somebody says, it's a bit like the argument with the nurses that's going on at the moment. <laughs> we will have 50,000 extra nurses. No, we won't. We, will, we might have 30,000 and we might persuade 20 to stay. This is a similar thing where they're confusing a prediction, two predictions, and giving us a percentage reduction which sounds like it's a reduction on today's figures <coughs> when it's not. Okay? You've got that general... Right, so if you're actually comparing the, the, the figures with the road against today's figures, then for some of the roads, there's still a drop, but generally it's much less. For some of the roads, the traffic goes up. Now, this is a map that they provided. It's our slightly altered version of it to make it clearer but we can refer this back to a map in the outline business case. Now, all the roads in red, the traffic levels will go up against the do minimum. Not against today's figures, but against the do minimum. This includes Berwick Road, and all the way out, uh, up, up, up to Bash Church. It includes parts of the inner ring road. This is New Street. The traffic levels, if they build the road, will go up compared to the do minimum scenario on New Street. <coughs> so we said, well, what happens if we compare the figures to today? Well, you might notice this is today's figures. I'll talk them back. There's a fair bit of blue in there and only a little bit of red. Look at how much red there is now. So they're saying, on their own figures, that if they build the road in 2037, not only will there be more traffic on Berwick Road and New Street, there'll be more traffic on St Michael's Street and Castle Forgate. There'll be more traffic on the whole of the inner ring road. There'll be more traffic on the whole of the outer ring road.
So, what would the uh, North West Road do? It would increase traffic levels overall because you're adding capacity to the road network, you're encouraging people to use their cars more. According to their own business case, it would, it, uh, it would in, uh, increase traffic 50% on current levels on Berwick Road from Copenhagen. I don't know how many of you ever drive up there, but uh, that uh, T-junction from Coatney Hill onto Berwick Road is already a really difficult uh, situation. If you're driving into town from uh, Greenfields and you want to turn right onto Berwick Road, you stop all the traffic behind you, they can't get through. Uh, so I've highlighted just a few of these here. Plus, you've got the noise nuisance from a 26 metre high bridge and raised section. It would also divert resources, 25 million pounds minimum, um, from uh, more worthy schemes, including wider community facilities around the county. Plus, Shropshire Council will be responsible for any overspend. The government has made clear that their offer is that's it, 54 million, that's what you get. We're not quite sure why the road, the price of the road dropped suddenly two years ago. Uh, I strongly suspect that when the tenders come in, they will find that they're much higher than, than um, what they're expecting. And hopefully at that stage, um, Shropshire Council will see sense and say, no, we cannot afford this, we, we cannot go ahead. Plus, of course, there's the cost of the national purse, plus the carbon cost of construction. I would go on about landscape and, and, and all the rest of it, but um, uh, there are people better qualified than me to do that who are coming on. So, what it might do, well, it might reduce traffic on Smithfield Road a bit. A bit. The figures on Mardall Quay, which is the area just over, <coughs> over from the river from us here, according to their figures, would be 11% lower than current figures. Now, 11%, isn't that one in nine? One in nine cars would be removed from Mardall Quay if they built the road compared to current levels. One in nine. Yep, I'm nearly done. There are slightly greater reductions further down Smithfield Road, but that's the pinch point. So what's the point of having a reduction slightly better? And does the, is the model actually trustworthy? Does it actually deal adequately enough with induced traffic? What I've said for years is that as soon as Smithfield Road becomes quiet, you know, people in, in Mountfields will suddenly decide they want to go and shop in Morrisons, and people in Castlefields will suddenly decide they, they, they want to nip through town for various reasons to get up. What it might do, well, 20% reductions on Coton Hill are predicted, but this would be the shortest route into town off the ring road. Surely if you wanted to get to the station or nip in, um, a park, you know, that would be, a, that would be a, a really good way to come in rather than uh, coming in off um, any of the other routes. Large reductions are predicted for, for roads northwest of Shrewsbury through, the, through the, the Rat Run lanes, but there is substantial industry and housing on this route. There's a number of chicken farms being built out there in the last few years. So there's the Lakeland Industrial Estate. There's more housing at Bass Church and Bowmere Heath. So I, I'm pretty certain that, that that is overstated. I think the people who live up that way will be disappointed when the road is built. But if, if sorry, did I say when? <laughs> if, if the road is built, they will be disappointed. And even if the road, the traffic levels did reduce on Huffley Lane, you've got that situation where it's suddenly it's now onto a T-junction instead of into the roundabout. So you can imagine the morning, the queue there in the morning peak people trying to get um, out of Huffington. Of what it will not do, <coughs> and, and, and even the, even the most, most of the same people at Shropshire Council don't even credit that it will, that it will affect most of the town centre, there are no figures in the, in the outline business case for Castle Street, Wildcop, High Street. There is for Town Walls, strangely, and Town Walls is shown to go up. Um, 
It would not solve air quality problems, because, um, and it certainly wouldn't be transformative, which is the stated aim of the large local majors fund. But isn't, isn't it needed for the growth of Shrewsbury? Shrewsbury is a growing town, we've got lots of new houses, and, and to me that makes sense. If you're going to put houses in Shropshire, Shrewsbury seems to be a good place to put them. But going forward, we've had a lot in the last few years, but a lot, lot of that house building has been making up for the shortfall after the, um, the financial problems of 2008. The plan going forward is roughly 400 housing dwellings a year, which is what it's been historically for a number of years now. That's 1% of the current stock. And one of the arguments always put for the need for this housing is that there's overcrowding, there are families sharing within the existing housing stock. So it's not even a 1% increase in population because some of those houses, dwellings will be uh, filled by splitting families, smaller family size. So the growth in population is less than 1%. Surely we can cope with the growth in population of Shrewsbury of less than 1% without um, building the North West Road. So I believe the North West Road would be a road in the wrong direction at a time when we need to be concentrating on decarbonising as fast as possible. And that's without even considering this landscape and wildlife effects. Thank you. As David said, questions will be ideally at the end. Do we have a slot at the end of the session, at the end of today, which will be going to work for you. Okay, and um, our next speaker is Andrew Evans um, uh, from the uh, Shrewsbury Business uh, Chamber. I might also add, before Andrew speaks, that of course you know, all of you, that the money from central government, 54 million, has been allocated. And Chris Grayling, who was a quote sent out a while back, from Chris Grayling, I thought I would read that before Andrew speaks, because it uh, supported the North West Relief Road is just what Shrewsbury needs to reduce traffic, uh, congestion in and around the town. We are investing 54 million in this exciting new scheme, helping drivers get from A to B more quickly, while improving air quality for residents. The scheme will also include two new bridges and accessible crossings allowing cyclists, pedestrians, and vulnerable users to travel safely. And of course, you probably know that the town council has also come out in favor of the scheme, as has the business improvement district, and also March's local enterprise partnership, LEP, and uh, Midlands Connect as well. So I can elaborate a bit more about that later on. So I'll hand you over to Andrew. Andrew, do you want to come up here and speak? The microphone is fixed on the tray, so we have to do it now. I have an apology to make, first of all. I've got a bit of a cold, so uh, uh, please forgive me if I, uh, I sniffle and uh, cough a little bit. This is me playing for the sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Andrew Evans. Uh, I'm a uh, Shrewsbury born and bred. <coughs> I'm a solicitor uh, working locally. Uh, this afternoon I'm here to speak on behalf of Shrewsbury Business Chamber. The uh, Chamber supports and promotes the businesses of Shrewsbury uh, and in line with its objective supports the North West Relief Road. When I arrived this afternoon, John described me as the most important person here. Uh, I rather think he was talking about me as a sacrificial lamb. There's <laughs> 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 um, sucker. Um, before I proceed further, I'd like to make it clear that uh, I have no involvement whatsoever in the Northwest Relief Road, any part of the proposals relating to it, uh, nor do I profess to be any kind of expert in relation to it. Uh, the Business Chamber's approach to uh, Send a representative to speak in support of the road this afternoon. Uh, that was at the time when Shropshire Council was supposed to be the main speakers. Uh, so my contribution was going to be saying, I support it. <laughs> uh, but 
But without the council's involvement, um, I don't see that today really will achieve the balanced forum that was intended. Um, I neither have the expertise nor qualifications to provide any in-depth commentary relating to the road. But uh, I will at least expand upon the, the Chamber's reasoning for supporting the road. So this is a little bit more than just saying I support it. Um, I moved away from Shrewsbury to study law and to qualify as a solicitor. Uh, I worked away from home in the early years and returned to Shrewsbury in 1989. I'm a property lawyer, and uh, one of the first things I noticed when I came back was on the local searches, it referred to, quotes, the preferred proposed route of the Northwest Relief Road, unquote. I think at that time there were about three different routes that were proposed. That was 30 years ago, um, and the road still remains unbuilt. People say they're fed up with Brexit after three years. <laughs> The Northwest West Relief Road has been under discussion for well in excess of 30 years. Brexit's still at nursery school at the moment. <laughs> the North West Relief Road has grown up, it's moved away from home, and it's just about entering its midlife crisis at the moment. Um, it's something that's been endlessly debated and endlessly consulted upon over the years. Uh, the latest consultation was, I think, in 2017. Um, and the Chamber at that time did give some uh, comments in relation to it. But at the time of the 2017 consultation, there were 68% of people who responded that were actually in favour of the road. 68%, that's obviously you know, two thirds of the, uh, the population that responded were actually in favour of it. So the Chamber gave various uh, comments in favour of it at the time. I just wanted to run through the bullet points that were given at that time. The road is required for economic growth. It will provide a positive message to encourage investment. It will decrease cross town traffic. It will relieve congestion around Holstead, Smithfield Road, Frankwell, Ellesmere Road, Ditherington. It will provide better links between Shrewsbury and North Shropshire and Wales. It will improve the town centre experience for shoppers, residents, and tourists alike, and alleviate traffic on rural roads. Now, there's a number of reports on economic matters covering Shropshire. Transportation is a key component for growth. In no particular order, <coughs> uh, the Midlands Connect strategy, published in 2017, it identified the Birmingham Telford Shrewsbury Transport Corridor as an intensive growth corridor and the North West Relief Road is specified as a means of enhancing economic potential by improving connectivity for local businesses and reducing congestion on the A5 to, to facilitate growth and create jobs. The March's Strategic Economic Plan, Accelerating Growth Through Opportunity, was published five years ago. It considered the barriers to growth as a result of poor accessibility to employment centres, ageing transport infrastructure and congestion. The North West Relief Road was mentioned by the March's LEP as one of six long-term infrastructure policies to deliver increased housing, significant benefits to Shrewsbury and the town centre in particular. The March's LEP strategy for growth recognised investment in transport as a priority area to reduce congestion, to expand the movement of the workforce and create greater access to jobs. The North West Relief Road is seen as a means for economic potential in the whole region. Then there was a March as a Mid Wales freight strategy, published in 2017, aimed to ensure efficient movement of freight. In March and Mid Wales. The key issue identified was the quality of the road network, slowing journey times, and causing a lack of reliability. The strategy identified the North West Relief Road as one of eight major schemes to reduce congestion, save on journey times, and increase reliability for freight journeys. Shropshire Council has ambitious plans through the Growth Point Initiative and the Economic Growth Strategy. 
for promoting economic growth for Shrewsbury, including developing land to the west for urban extension. We already have the northern side with the employment areas, but the river loop constrains future development at the moment. The Northwest Relief Road would make these centres more accessible, more attractive for business. It's an important element in linking employment areas, increasing economic success, delivering housing, employment and social infrastructure to grow the town. It would also benefit the urban extension to the south through reducing congestion. <coughs> The, uh, the Shrewsbury Big Town Plan is looking to prioritise better movement in and around the town by alleviating traffic congestion. The North West Relief Road will help in this respect. It will encourage improvement in the town centre, encourage tourism, it will have a knock-on effect of increasing investment, employment and growth in the local economy. The Shropshire Local Plan includes the North West Relief Road as part of its core strategy. The National Planning Policy Framework emphasises the importance of rebalancing the transport system in favour of sustainable development. <coughs> the Chamber echoes the views of Shropshire Council in this respect that the road will support the sustainable development of the Shrewsbury West Urban Extension. All of these reports policies and proposals for the future economic growth of the town and the wider region include the North West Relief Road as an integral feature of it. Anyone who lives in and around Shrewsbury doesn't need a report to tell them that there's too much congestion around Shrewsbury and its centre. Anyone travelling from Oswestry will know the regular tailbacks of Dobby's Island. Any local will be familiar with the taking traffic coming into town from Ditherington. <coughs> They'll have experienced the queues in Frankbone on the Smithfield Road. It isn't hard to spot the problems of noise, visual intrusion, and poor air quality around the town <coughs> centre. And this will only worsen as time goes on unless a problem is sorted. Reduce congestion will help to free up the town centre. It will reduce carbon emissions, and improve air quality. It will make it a better environment to attract visitors and the revenue which they'll bring to the town. Last week, at the Shrewsbury Business Chamber held a Hustings event. Uh, in, dis in discussing the topics of social care, one of the uh, local candidates, I forget which one it was, uh, quoted a figure indicating that Shropshire has one of the highest demographics of older people. Now, it's great that we have a county that people want to come to retire to, but what about the young talent locally? <laughs> Too many of our youngsters move away for further education and don't return because job opportunities are better elsewhere. If we're to hold on to our talented young, we have to encourage inward investment through business. A joined up road network with Wales, the North and Birmingham Plugging the missing link with the North West Relief Road has to be one way of showing business that Shrewsbury is a place to work as well as a place to retire. There's a great song by Bruce Springsteen called Thunder Road. It ends with the lines, It's a town full of losers and I'm pulling out of here to win. Now, if we don't need a Thunder Road to encourage people to leave the town, what we need is a North West Relief Road to get people to stay and become a town full of winners. Thank you very much for listening. Well, you know, as already, there, are, there is support for this scheme from various other sources. As I said, also, Shrewsbury Town Council has expressed its support for the scheme. So has the Business Improvement District. So has the Marches Local Enterprise Partnership, the LEP. I did invite them to come to speak today, the LEP, but they've said because it's so near to the general election, they're not allowed to because this further period. So, anyway, we move on. Thank you very much, Andrew. So, uh, we hit the next speaker is Peter Gilbert from Sustainable Transport Shropshire. Peter, do you want to come forward?
Hello everyone. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm Keith Gilbert. Um, I've lived in Shrewsbury for about 10 years now, over in Coburg Hill. Um, and I was asked to just give a little bit of background um, about my involvement with the road and also, bear in mind that I'm speaking from a sustainable transport point of view, my background there. I wasn't quite sure how far I wanted me to go, but um, <laughs> I'm the unbearded one <laughs> at that point. So um, that was at a um, company Christmas do uh, back in the mid-50s um, with the bus company, coach company, Timsons in South London, where my father used to manage at that point. Um, anyway. Um, so perhaps my interest in transport probably goes back to my upbringing when I used to go in, into his office at weekends and sometimes go on the buses and, and all that kind of stuff. But actually rather than being fixated on vehicles and this kind of stuff, I'm actually more interested in, in the way people move around and how they can do that without harming either themselves or harming anyone else in their process of moving. So, um, since coming here, um, I've been involved both in setting up uh, a group called Bus Users Shropshire um, to help uh, ensure that we continue to have bus services in Shropshire, uh, and then more recently this group, Sustainable Transport Shropshire, which has about 50 people or so involved in uh, encouraging our council to look at truly sustainable alternatives uh, for getting around. So. Um, when talking about roads, I think climate change is the real game changer. As has been said by Andrew and, and others, you know, we've been talking about uh, the North West Relief Road for decades, but what has changed is I think that the understanding of climate change has moved from something which was a huge concern to thousands of scientists for several decades to one which at last this year has reached public consciousness and some politicians at least recognize it as the major issue of that time. Um, CO2, uh, which is really what we're talking about largely, uh, accumulates in our atmosphere. It's a bit like the national debt. Um, it goes up every year, um, adding billions and now to have trillions of extra tons of CO2 in our atmosphere. And it's like putting blankets on the bed. You know, some of them are good. They make you comfortable uh, and relaxed, but if you keep piling on too many bedclothes, which is what we're doing with so much CO2 now, uh, you start to stifle. And we've reached a now or never situation. Um, the United Nations Secretary Generals, the previous one and the present one, have from time to time, I guess more or less every year or two, um, lectured the leaders of the countries of the world calling for action and their requests have become ever more shrill through frustration that nothing has happened. In this uh, quote from a speech given at, uh, in New York um, in <coughs> September last year, um, he says, uh, and so this is speaking live to leaders of the nations of the world, dear friends of planet Earth, Thank you for coming to the United Nations headquarters today. I've asked you here to sound the alarm. Climate change is the defining issue of our time, and we are at a defining moment. We face a direct existential threat. Climate change is moving faster than we are, and its speed has provoked a sonic boom SOS across our world. If we do not change course by 2020, we risk missing the point. So by 2020, and bear in mind, he was speaking in September 2018, so uh, we're nearly there now. We risk missing the point where we can avoid runaway climate change with disastrous consequences. Uh, and he went on, um, that's why today I'm appealing for leadership from politicians, from business and scientists, and from the public everywhere. We have the tools to make our actions effective. What we still lack, even after the Paris Agreement, is the leadership and the ambition to do what is needed. Ladies and gentlemen, we can all be leaders in this. This road is a proposal from a different age that will not save us seconds or minutes, but will add fuel onto the fire. 
as every new road does. It increases the number of car journeys. And each time you block off a road, car use goes down. And this was recognised by Shropshire County Council. Uh, they commissioned a report when Dog Pole was closed for six weeks for a gas main replacement. And there's a, a study which is available online. It's on our, Shropshire, on our Sustainable Transport of Shropshire um, site. Uh, as to what the results were for the retailers of town, with no traffic going through Dog Pole, what happened to traffic levels all across the town. And, and the results actually were that retail improved, traffic levels everywhere dropped except in St Michael Street where there were big tailbacks, um, and that more people were walking and cycling. And, the, and they make the comment that St Michael Street there were big tailbacks, sometimes as far as Heathgates, um, but equally the traffic lights sequencing hadn't been altered. Uh, by the railway station, so obviously things could be, if that was made a permanent arrangement, things could be changed. So, we, I wanted to mention also the Bank of England Governor, Mark Carney, who has warned the finance industry against investments in coal and oil, which at some point, <coughs> perhaps suddenly, will become unusable, and therefore they will have no worth as investments. And I think we need to avoid creating a stranded asset of our own on the northwest of Shrewsbury. The Welsh have done it. For years there's been talk of an M4 relief road around New Newport. One road route was eventually chosen and planning consent had been arranged. And then in June this year, the Welsh Government did it. They cancelled the M4 relief road, citing cost and environmental concerns, and decided to focus on public transport solutions instead. Each morning in the Guardian newspaper, they publish on their weather page the latest figures from Hawaii from the International Measuring Station for the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And they show how, at the moment, it's about 410 parts per million and they compare them with a week ago, a year ago, ten years ago, and they also show what it used to be in pre-industrial times, and you can see that we are now 17% above what is generally considered a safe level for humanity and other life, and it's still going up uh, each year by about two, but with no signs of us um, curtailing it. Each time we hop in a car, part of the fuel turns into carbon dioxide gas. So I, one of my little aids, memoir, is this expensive sugar I bought yesterday for this event. Um, so this is what used to be just over two pounds of sugar, it's one kilogram of sugar. That represents the amount of CO2 which our car, which is a Fiat 500, uh, 1.2 litre, so a very small engine car, that's the amount it gives off into the atmosphere if we drive three miles somewhere and three miles back again. Because our car is about 100 grams per kilometre, and if you do the mass multiplying it up to miles, and so uh, a total of just over six miles will, with a small car, will produce one kilogram of CO2. And that then stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, warming us. And you can imagine if you just multiply that up by going a bit further or more cars, you can see how we got into this huge mess. Electric cars could be an answer far into the future, but half of the carbon in car use comes from the manufacture of a car. And electric cars are made in, in a way that is just as carbon intensive as, as in the other car. So uh, regardless of the use of the, of, the, of the car and where that electricity comes from, we're still building in masses of carbon every time people use a car. So we need to get to the situation where people in our town can do almost all of their local journeys without even thinking of using a car. And Chris Grayling was mentioned earlier, the former Secretary of State for Transport, when he was Secretary of State, this document came out, the Cycling and Walking Investment Strategy, and its subheading is 
we want to make cycling and walking the natural choices for shorter journeys or as part of a longer journey. And when I was here a couple of years ago, when the Growing Forward talks were happening, I finished up with a quote from Chris Grayling, which, was, which I had it with me now. Because <laughs> in that quote, uh, the foreword to this document, he actually said that for too long, cycling and walking had you know, kind of been the Cinderella's and ignored, not taken seriously. And actually, they had huge benefits, both for the health and the air quality and, and all kinds of things. So, um, and so as well as cycling and walking, we need, of course, public transport to be there for people who with luggage or people who just can't use cycles, tricycles, and mobility scooters. How am I doing on time? I've got three, three minutes. Oh, right. I was going to show a two-minute video, but I think I won't. <laughs> um, so, I think what we need to do is to focus on people rather than on vehicles. Um, vehicles take up such a lot of space when they're parked and while they're using the road, and it's actually the vehicles are the problem, not the people. So next time you see a queue of cars, cars queuing in Truesby, take a look at how many people are actually inside, and try to imagine them sitting in the road, but without a metal around them or something. I'm sure you can do it with the imagination. Um, you'd be surprised how spacious the road starts to look once you kind of eliminate the, the metal around people. You've got one person sitting maybe every 20 feet or something like that on a piece of tarmac. So this picture is actually taken from an American city um, representing 40 people. So you have 40 people sitting in those cars. Um, it's space taken up through the bus. 40 people standing, and also 40 people on bicycles uh, at the edge of the road. And, and just contrast well the amount of space that cars use, um, and that actually if we were able to transfer many or most of those journeys that are currently made by car in Shrewsbury to other forms of, of transport, Actually, there's plenty of space for everyone, whether we you know, have a bigger population or not. At this point, people often in, in meetings pipe up about, what about the disabled? Well, bikes are stealth disability aids. They really are. They, um, many people find it a lot easier to get about on a bike, uh, supporting their weight on a saddle rather than on their knees. And it's easier to extricate yourself off a bike than out of the seat of a car. And it may be the only way someone with a disability can get exercise. Obviously, it depends on the disability, um, but that is true of many people. No one likes having bikes on pavements, do we? So, anyone like bikes on pavements here? But no one wants it, but unfortunately, that's what we've got. Um, our council decided against providing separate cycleways for bikes and mobility scooters and instead lumped everyone onto our two narrow pavements. Well, highways departments call pavements footways, and that seems a really good description, doesn't it? Uh, and I'd like to see footways actually reserved for walking uh, wherever there are people actually using them. But what that means, of course, is that where we've got vehicles that each way tons, like a car, buses and lorries, sharing our streets, we need to protect people so they can actually use bikes and, and feel safe doing that. But most people think that cycling is too dangerous to do, um, so we need to make it safer and to feel safer so that children and their parents, is that one minute, is it? Yeah. Um, older people and women particularly don't feel it's a risk. In London, um, segregated cycleways are well used, and in Greater Manchester, they're building 1,800 miles of walking and cycling routes under the title B lines. Um, things like that all help deliveries as well. They, so, there's a Sainsbury delivery in London, um, there's another example there of electric van and also electric trike. Um, that is really catching on for you know last mile or two deliveries. Um, 
in our suburban areas, we don't actually need segregated cycleways. We can just make our roads quieter and, and safer. Um, here we've got bollards in one of the in the road near Racecourse Lane, so that bikes and people can walk through, but cars can't. That gives an advantage in time for non-car traffic. And as is mentioned, 20 miles an hour is a really effective way and most cost-effective way of making somewhere feel safer. But uh, 20 miles an hour, people on the footway or in the street actually feel better about it, and drivers have actually got more time to react, to slow down and to stop without hitting anyone. Shropshire Council is currently resisting the introduction of wide area 20 miles an hour. And lastly, I just wanted to say a little bit about public transport. We are crisscrossed by train lines in Shrewsbury, and often people spend a lot of time thinking about where we could put in extra stations, but actually a far more effective way of getting far more people moving in Shrewsbury is to use buses. And not the noisy, vibrating hand-me-downs that we get at the moment, but uh, quiet electric ones that accelerate smoothly. Okay, thank you, I hear. With traffic priority in, in streets. So, you know, here's, a, here's a, a bus actually in the far distance, held up by stationary or very slow moving traffic in High Street. I don't see how the North West Relief Road would make any difference to these cross town movements. People coming over the English Bridge, um, heading through the town centre, whereas actually much better bus services and having cycling and walking prioritised rather than car prioritised, which is what happens at the moment, uh, would be far better for everyone and would mean we could actually have an efficient bus service rather than one that's going at the same pace as the cars. And our bus station, um, instead of demolishing it, which the council wants to do, we need some TLC. Where is it? The Darwin Shopping Centre has clean toilets. You go down the escalators to the bus station and they leave an awful lot to be desired. Um, here's pictures of Gloucester. The top one isn't true, but it's Gloucester bus station that was. Now the one below is being constructed. Um, and in places as far afield as Aberystwyth and Truro or Stourbridge, <coughs> they've all had new bus stations recently. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a climate emergency <coughs> declared here in Shropshire, a climate of inactivity and health, which in Shropshire, 73% of our adults are overweight or obese, which is above the national average. We have a misallocation of urban space to the most inefficient form of transport. So how do we get to the nirvana of travel that's easy, stress-free and inexpensive? Well, the short answer is that Shropshire, I mean, it's probably good news, um, see if you think so. All the levers to do this are held by Shropshire Council. So in other words, if you can persuade Shropshire Council to do it, it can be done. They're the responsible authority, not only for highways, but for planning for health, public health, land use, education, <coughs> vulnerable people, the economy, and so on. And they've shown they can get money if it's something that they want badly enough. Their own transport plan says that reducing the need to travel and doing it sustainably is their first priority for highways, and the fifth priority is roads. Yet, it's the fifth priority is the one they've been pushing all along. We're in a crisis of epic proportions, ladies and gentlemen. We here can lead, to lead our council to do what they need to do, and also to show them what they mustn't do. <laughs> URL is where various papers like the Dodpole report from the County Council, our own reports to the Big Town Plan and so on are located, and then there's an email address for us, and we are on Facebook under Sustainable Transport for Shropshire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I, I might mention the Civic Society, of course, does look at these things, and uh, some time ago I was advocating that parking rides shouldn't just be seen as a facility for tourists, it should also be 
providing residence. And there should be electric buses. And shortly after I sat there, I, did, I saw, I thought, thank you, that's good. Maybe I should write some more lessons. But anyway, I think it, it is starting to happen. Maybe that as the town grows outwards, more people will be using park and ride as <coughs> residents, not just tourists. But anyway, so that's good. Thank you very much, Peter. And our next, our next speaker is John Whitelake, Professor John Whitelake, who is a, a trustee of the Civic Society and an expert in sustainable transport uh, in all sorts of areas of Europe. But we're still in Europe at the moment, we mustn't forget. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, that's good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for turning up in such large numbers. Um, the subject I'm tackling now, I would normally spend seven, eight, or nine hours talking about. I have probably 14 minutes, so do bear with me. I occasionally skip slides and try and simplify. So before I, uh, having listened to what's just gone before, I want to say two things before we go into the slides. Um, there are huge problems in the world of transport, transport planning, traffic engineering, traffic planning, urban planning, and so on and so forth. But the fundamental problem is a total unwillingness to look at evidence. Uh, serious uh, data, experience. I've appeared at, a, at over a dozen public inquiries into road proposals. And it's quite clear there's not one council anywhere in England or Scotland or Wales that has ever taken on board two fundamental pieces of evidence. One, there is not one example anywhere in Britain of a congestion problem uh, that has promised to be resolved by building a new road that has been. So, not one example anywhere. <laughs> I am bewildered why it is so difficult to get that point over. And of course, uh, I am a professor in the university and we tend to be very boring and talk a lot about academic reports and statistics and so on. Uh, that doesn't wash, but I challenge, and I frequently do this at inquiries, please provide me with one example. There isn't one. The next point is, is equally worrying. There isn't one example of a new road with evidence rather than Aspirational, aspirational generalities. There isn't one example of a new road built because it would support growth or the local economy or create jobs or attract inward investment that has done any of that. It just does not work that way. And that's what I'm going to try and explain in what's now a lot less. So I'm not going to go into the, the kind of detail I could do if we had more time, which is why inspectors at public inquiries don't like me, so we'll, we'll skip on. There is a fundamental problem about transport and transport investment, which is still very difficult for most politicians, and indeed many very professional and highly skilled traffic engineers and planners to, to get to grips with. So, for example, there is huge economic growth in many parts of the United Kingdom and many parts of the world where there's massive congestion. Congestion is not a block on economic growth. It does not stop the economy. It does not lead to job loss. It creates difficulties, in t and I'm very sympathetic with anyone stuck in traffic jams. I'm frequently stuck in, on the number 24 and 25 bus, in truth, behind lots of traffic. So congestion uh, is a fact of life. It tends to increase over time, unless we do certain things, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later if I have time. And it, it's not a block on economic growth, so that's not the problem. Uh, areas which have very little transport investment, um, if, um, Pendle, East Lancashire, Inverness, for example, uh, tend to have quite strong economic growth. So the lack of transport, this wonderful word, infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of transport investment, again, is not a drag on the economy. Uh, part of my early career, I'm avoiding telling you about my strange mixed up career, but my early career was transport and economic development officer in the Outer Hebrides. <laughs> we were somewhat remote, somewhat isolated, depended on inter island air services, which I ran, and ferries, and post buses, and stage carriage buses, and in fact we had a thriving, it's not very relevant to Shrewsbury, I hate to add, I'm not recommending this, uh, but we had a thriving crab fishing, lobster fishing, seaweed processing and tweed industry, which I promoted heavily, and we had lots of job creation and lots of new investment in the most difficult, remote, transport inaccessible region of Britain, or maybe it was in Shetland, I don't know. Uh, we have many examples in Britain of thing, things that have been built to rescue a depressed economy. One of the best examples is the Humber Bridge. It didn't. 
uh, that part of Yorkshire, which is in fact a delightful place uh, to, to live, and Lincolnshire across the water, still has significant economic problems. The city region in Britain with the greatest level of high quality uh, motorway investment is Glasgow. Glasgow has some of the highest levels of expensive motorways of any city in Europe and significant economic problems. The motorways have made no difference at all. Liverpool has significant economic problems and has excellent motorway, excellent uh, uh, electrified rail, excellent port facilities, you've got everything. But there's something about Liverpool that doesn't quite work and we don't have time to go into that. So <laughs> transport, <laughs> transport investment is of course something that we, we, we need to pay attention to. But we mustn't get into this kind of uh, pretend world that if you build a new road somewhere, it will liberate masses of economic development and growth and jobs and even investment. It does not work that way. I'll, I'll skip a few things as I said. One of the amazing things about transport research and transport infrastructure and monitoring things over time is the so-called two-way road effect. Now this is in a UK government report. The two-way road effect says if you build a nice big shiny new road, it might attract some jobs in, but it will drain away some jobs as well. Because if you improve the transport system, then lots of large companies that employ people and have locations in different parts of a region, or a larger area than a region, what they will do, and this has happened in South Wales, it's well, well and truly demonstrated, and when the M4 opened into, into South Wales, lots of people said, yippee, we will retreat to Bristol. We'll service the whole of Cardiff, Bridge End and Swansea from Bristol, and we'll shut down our operations in, in South Wales, because we're a nice new motorway, and we can get there quickly. So there is a two-way road effect, and this official government policy, it's in a document I'll refer to again, and there are lots of other changes that can take place. You can improve accessibility in one area, and that can drain jobs away from another area. It's a bit like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It doesn't stop the ship sinking, but it looks impressive when you do it. Um, empirical evidence. Uh, there isn't time to go into sky bridge, borders rail, and so on and so on. But there are lots and lots of reviews of the links between building new roads and economic development, inward investment, so anyone in Shrewsbury that thinks this new role will stimulate the local economy is simply mistaken from an empirical, evidence, case study point of view. This is one of the most impressive research documents in transport anywhere in the world. Um, and it's the UK government, Transport and the Economy, and it says that building new roads might have some marginal effects here and there, but the evidence is disputed, it's weak, and there's no real documented evidence to show that it works. And one small anecdote, I was a visiting professor of transport in Denmark for a while, and the professor in Denmark, the head of my department, said, I'm very impressed with transport in Britain, so that worried me, because I thought the man that what the fall of might not be very good. He said, I'm very impressed. You've got fantastic documents, fantastic research. We're using all our teaching. Why do you do so badly on the ground? <laughs> Why do you not implement anything that really works? Why do you produce all this fantastic research and then ignore it? You've got such poor quality public transport, you've got rubbish cycling facilities. Uh, your trains are rubbish, dirty. I mean, Cardiff to Manchester through Shrewsbury. Dirty, diesel, polluting trains. They still drop me up. You won't like what I'm going to say. I do apologise. Uh, why, when I stand on platform 7B at Shrewsbury Station, do I look at poo and the toilet paper? You know, in Germany and in Denmark and Sweden and the Netherlands and everywhere else, they cannot believe it when I say that people go on trains and they poo and it sits on the track. And you're on platform 7B at Shrewsbury, you watch it. We've got dirty diesel trains, they're often late, they don't connect resources, and they're disgusting and they're overcrowded. So, again, but we've got excellent research. Trans the research, evidence, data, the links between transport investment and economic growth are very limited, poorly understood, and not necessarily additional. What that means is, if you really, really do want to get rid of congestion, if you really do want to improve the economy, you start off with things like education, high quality schools, high quality public transport, high quality community facilities, high quality youth facilities, and, and the whole, what some people call social capital, the whole social infrastructure. Because these are far more important than a shiny road to enable some people, one person weighing 75 kilos, sitting in one car, weighing one ton, trying to drive somewhere where there's lots of buses as an alternative, or there should be. And there are lots of research reports. Uh, this is 
and one that's particularly good that goes through the whole economic development, newly generated traffic. By the way, if this road is built, and I sincerely hope it is not built, there's such a thing as induced traffic. There will be between 10 and 20% more vehicles than the councils, consultants and researchers are advocating as a result of building the road. And that means that we'll have more congestion in Shrewsbury and all the things we could do to reduce congestion will be sidelined even more. There'll be no more spending funding on buses and the alternatives. Now, another moan. I'm very good at whinging, which is why I have no friends. <laughs> um, we do need new housing. Now, why is it that in German cities, which is not on this slide, I can take you to half a dozen car-free residential areas with 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 people who willingly, willingly go and live there because they can't park their car. And there's no car parking. They're designed to be car-free. And they work really well. Uh, they do need something we don't know much about in Britain, which is called high-quality public transport, <laughs> that is put in place before the houses are built. Uh, if you want to see real stupidity, it's not just a Shropshire problem, it's a general problem in this country, we will build a housing estate in a big green field where there's no pedestrian footpath, no cycling facilities, and the last saw a bus in 1934. Now, that is no way to do it. Now, even in the United States, uh, I don't know of Tempe, I know it's on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona, but I was delighted when I got a message from my American chums that this is a new plan and it's being built. And there will be a thousand residents and zero private cars. We can have new housing and we can have a population influx if we wish, and it does not have to be wrapped around a ton of metal called a car to be stuck in the traffic jam. Now, I do wish to criticise Shropshire Council and planning on the Copthorne Barrett scheme, which I've gone into in some detail. So if you want to move from the sublime and the utopian and the intelligent to the other end of the scale, you can look at Copthorne Barrett. 458 car parking spaces for 216 dwellings on a road with a frequent bus service, which is within walking and cycling distance of most destinations in Shrewsbury. Who on earth would want to give that planning permission? The answer is Shropshire Council. It, 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 it is adding to traffic congestion, adding to pollution, adding to carbon, making everything worse. It's no wonder we, we think building a new road is a good idea, because we spend six days a week making the problem worse, and on the seventh day we think we'll build a new road to make it better. You know, it, 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 it just it defies understanding and belief. Okay, uh, some nice things. Um, climate change is certainly one of the biggest challenges. People call it existential or whatever. We have declared a climate emergency. There are lots of things we can do immediately, not in 10, 15 years' time, immediately to reduce reliance on the private car, to reduce the number of vehicles, reduce vehicle kilometres, reduce air pollution and reduce carbon. There's very little sign of any of these things happening. So, for example, uh, um, Peter, I'm very pleased to refer to the bus station, we need a new bus station, we need a new fleet of electric buses, we need, uh, I choose 100 kilometres because there are various kind of guidelines on what you need per thousand of the population around the world. New segregated bike paths. Every school needs to be linked to all the housing areas, all leisure and recreation with safe, segregated, totally safe bike paths. We need to convert all Shropshire Council and Town Council buildings to 100% renewable energy and we need to have car-free prize-winning boosts to tourism, which I'll come back to in a moment. Okay, now this is one of my favourite slides. What do you think that is? What does it look like? It's a bus station. Uh, if any of you have ever spent some time, like I did yesterday, in Shrewsbury bus station, you will be in a state of shock when you look at that and you compare the reality. We have a dirty, disgusting, smelly, urine infected, miserable place with no staff, no real-time information, and it is appalling. It is a disgrace. What is the only town in Europe? What is the only town in Europe that closes its bus station on a Sunday with steel shutters? I hope somebody will prove me wrong. I keep asking people around the world. Uh, my German, Danish, Dutch and Swedish colleagues cannot believe it. They just don't believe it. And I said, well, have you been to Church Stretton and Craven Arms? <laughs> uh, they've not seen a bus since 1934. <laughs> okay, okay, moving on quickly to conclusion. There's so much we can do. Climate change is a problem, it is a crisis, it is dire. And you don't need me to emphasise that. 
There are places around the world which are getting to grips with it massively. And by the way, Shropshire Council is cash rich. It's bought three shopping centres, 50 million squid. It wants about 20 million into building a road. So what about something like total renewable energy? Um, this is this is Vauban. This is a car-free residential area in Freiburg in Germany. We can have that. What do you think this place is? It is a football stadium that's 100% PV renewable energy. Freiburg again in southern Germany. We can do it. There's so much that we can do, and. What's that? Yeah. Uh, what we could have. And we want to really, really, really come to terms with the climate emergency. Then what we really need to do is something superb and big and game changing and significant. Car free shoes be within the city loop. There is it's river loop. There, there is no reason whatsoever. The, the, the geography of Shrewsbury is absolutely ideal. That area there within the river loop could be car free. Superb park and ride, superb electric buses, superb walking and cycling. Zero carbon, car free. So what's wrong with it? Just do it and stop tapping about it. <laughs> I think a good message, um, and I agree with Dave in regards to the title of the road. Um, we are, um, it's not just a climate uh, emergency, we're actually an ecological emergency as well. And um, if transport is a big part of the climate uh, issue, it's, uh, it's also a big part of the ecological one as well. So hopefully I'm going to sort of make a few links there that will um, have, a, have a resonance with you. Um, these few words here are the words from the uh, consultant that wrote the report for the, um, the, the relief road, the road. Um, so it's going to have a big effect, and they say so themselves in terms of the environment. There may be some pros, I'll come on to this in a minute in terms of why I don't think there'll be many pros, but these are some of the pros in terms of the, um, the mitigation measures that may or may not be possible if the road was to go ahead. <laughs> There's an awful lot of cons though. Um, I won't read it all out to you, but there you go, you've heard a lot of, a lot of them today. But uh, undoubtedly there will be an impact on the natural environment of this particular part of, uh, of Shrewsbury and, uh, and beyond. Um, I should also as well, I mean, Selby will touch on this later, um, there will be an impact on the landscape as well. I'm not going to touch on that, um, but needless to say, the red bits on that panel are the two bits of the landscape. And you can see where the bits of the landscape actually are uh, in terms of where the road goes. Now then, um, the road itself, um, we went through a process, we as a community in Shrewsbury went through a process over a year or so ago looking at the big town plan. And I find it slightly strange that we weren't particularly allowed to talk much about the relief road, the road in the context of that big town plan. What we did talk about though was you could have this plan here, the green wedge, um, which is in the top, uh, sort of top corner of that, uh, of that plan, that map. And um, that's where the relief road is going to go. Um, a very strange contradiction in terms. Um, we have a fantastic landscape and we put a road through it. Odd. Um, just to put a little bit more detail into, in, in, into that, um, it's all very well to sort of way back and say, you know, these are fantastic landscapes. But there's, there's evidence to prove the point there. Um, this is just a wee map to show you where the um, really important ancient trees are along the route. Um, they're well mapped, there are probably a few more than that as well. But those are some of the key ancient trees, many hundreds of years old, along the route. Some of those aren't going to sort of survive the test of time if the road goes ahead. Um, we also have a sort of whole, I mean, UK, England in particular is brilliant in terms of planning and sort of measuring stuff. It's having to be measured decline brilliantly. But anyway, this, this is a sort of a, a, a map that shows you the priority habitats as per Natural England, the government's own um, conservation agency. Um, the green bits there are the good bits along the route, 
um, whether it be fens, meadows, woodlands and the like. So this is a national sort of um, indication of the sort of impact um, that that road will have on some of those, um, those sites recognised nationally. Within 500 metres of, of, the, uh, of the road, um, there's a measure here of the number of species that are going to be impacted. We, we've counted 860 odd um, over a, a recent years, there's, there's probably far more than that. Uh, and some of those species on there are absolutely really at the critical sort of cusp uh, of, 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 well, of extinction, quite frankly, in, in this county. Um, we'd be looking to see um, sort of a, 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 a water bottles in that particular part of the, of the landscape uh, for the next few years. Um, to be fair, we've had some great successes with, with the likes of, of otters because of the um, quality of waterways that we have in the county um, and the undisturbed nature that they need to thrive to survive. In fact, it's a nice story. We used to have an office just outside here on the Welsh Bridge. And many people will remember the floating restaurant here. Uh, they used to feed the otters there at the closing time, which was rather nice. Um, so we're lucky to have nature in the town. Let's try and keep it like that. Um, likewise, birds as well. I mean, uh, this is probably even more critical because these things sort of move around a bit. They're going to be severed in terms of breaking the barriers, breaking the corridor where they travel, travel along. I'm not going to touch them fish much on this either, but birds in particular. And here we have some really, really critical ones. Kulu won't breed in Shropshire. I'll be amazed if they are breeding in Shropshire within five, within five years, maybe ten at the outside. They are a dire downward spiral. Um, so I'll go through each one of these species here and sort of tell you a tale of, a tale of woe. But along the route of the, uh, of the road, we've got sort of 19 red lists and 34 amber lists. They're just sort of traffic light lists as to how important the bird species actually are in the UK. We've got some brilliant ones on this, uh, this, 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 this particular part of the landscape. And this is just a sort of map to show you how it all hangs together in terms of the spatial positioning of the species that I've just quickly rattled through. Um, it's not great. It's not great if you're going to stick a, a big highway through it and bridges and what have you. But we do have, and this has been mentioned already, some, some pretty amazing sites in their own right. Uh, Oxen Pool, Sheldon Rath, the River Severn itself is a wildlife site, and uh, the old riverbed SSI, as you know, have been here for a few thousand years, to put it mildly. Uh, they will be a threat in terms of the water quality issues that will come about if this road goes, gets, gets put into place. And Henke Pool is of European significance, really. It's on its, it's, it's on its last legs already because of climate change. It's warming up so much, the peat is breaking up, the drainage is bad, the pollution in that area is bad, and then we're going to put a road next door to it as well. I mean, we're, 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 we're going to be on our last legs in terms of Henke Pool, um, by way of an example, if we go ahead with this road. So they're, 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 they're the key sites I've just mentioned, that's where they are, um, and uh, you can see the proximity to the road itself. <coughs> Just, I'll come back to this, this, the implications of this plan in, a, in, a, in, a, in about a minute's time, but this just gives you this, the context of Shrewsbury in terms of the really important wildlife sites that we've got in the town. You can see there's a, there's a lot around, around, around the route of the road, um, but just note also in the bottom, uh, sort of, as you look at the end of the left hand corner, there's not so much. Um, and uh, I just, uh, I'll come back to that in a minute in terms of uh, what that might mean in terms of future thinking. But I think this is one of the biggies. I mean, this really has got to be a biggie. And I'm, I'm sort of perhaps going off my, my, my brief a bit. And I know the Environment Agency and Seven Trend Water are very concerned about this. We do a lot of work with um, Seven Trend Water. Uh, when we last year spoke to work directly with 350 farmers in, in Shropshire. Not all in this particular area, but a lot of farmers because of the water supply issues that we have in this, this county. A lot of the time we have too much, as you know, part of that's climate change. A lot of times we don't have enough. Anyway, it's a critical issue, water. Well, anyway, we're going to put a road through where we get the water from the town from. Those two blobs show you where we get the water from, uh, from the town of Shrewsbury. Um, you could say it's bonkers. Um, we, we could also say there are technical solutions to get around that, and there probably are. But we're all humans, and humans are fallible, are they not? Uh, I wouldn't want to risk my water supply um, with a, a two, three lane, whatever it is, highway going through the middle of it. Now, um, I'll come back to um, that plan a little bit that I showed you a minute or so ago. These are where this is to do with the land allocation that the, the council has put into place. The green bits are sort of places where we're going to have houses, because we've sort of agreed that. And the red bits are where we might have houses, because we've almost agreed that. Um, and what you've got to remember is that we are, uh, as, as a county, going to have more houses in, um, in, in Shropshire, more than we've ever had in a generation by 2035. That's a lot of, a lot of properties. I'm not going to make any judgment about whether we need them or not. 
because obviously there's some fantastic, reasonable social economic arguments as to why we need them. Um, but I think it, uh, it, the cynic in me points, that points to possibly why we're actually talking about a relief road here. And you've got to think that maybe the relief road is as much about the positioning of where we put development as it is about transportation. Um, and I go back to that plan I showed you a minute ago. Maybe we have better places to put the houses, maybe around the existing uh, ring road, where there are sites of less uh, natural environmental sensitivity. I leave that one hanging there, but um, this road is undoubtedly linked heavily with the um, proposed future housing allocations that we see before us as a, as a generation in this, uh, in this county, in this, in this town. Um, now, we're sort of coming to sort of a different point in, in time. I mean, Dave, Dave is a very old man, Dave Green, as he tells us. You know, he's seen <laughs> when there was a horse and cart on the roof road. Right the arguments are changing now. That's the, that's the point I want to make. The arguments have changed. When this road was first talked about, I've been here 30 years, um, we had different arguments, and we might have scratched our head, but maybe this is a good idea. But now we're in a different place. And um, this great big bullet green block sort of represents one of the arguments we should be considering. We have a Climate Change Act. We have, uh, in March, Dove announced um, uh, offsetting rules and regulations. And that's offsetting about what development does in terms of its impact on the natural environment. And very crudely, very simplistically, we've sat and worked it out. All those species and sites that I've show, shown you. If we were to try and replicate the damage done to them by the road, an area the size of that green circle would need to be replicated to actually replace them. Now, that is not in the costs for the plan. So I'm not a big expert in engineering tenders. I would suspect they probably will be a little bit higher than we thought. But we haven't even put this sort of cost into the, into, into the reckoning. And equally, um, if we were to take some of the figures that we can extrapolate from our transport friends around carbon emissions, um, the most conservative figures we can come up with would actually mean that we would need to uh, create a sink. And this is Altman Wood, one of the important sites on, on, on the route. We need to create a sink that size for every year of carbon that that road emits. And that's just one year. Um, now, one or two of us might live beyond one year, maybe 30, 40, 50, our children will certainly be here a long time. So if we hit 50 years ahead, a sort of generation of bits, you need 50 of those, 50 of those to actually um, begin to suck up some of the carbon that is going to be belched out from that particular road. Um, and that's not understanding whatever's going to happen in terms of new technologies running into the future. Um, which I hope will make a difference, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm talking here to talk about what's going to happen now. Um, so a 20% cut in, in, in transport is easy in theory. What we need now to, to affect a 1.5 degree change by 2030. These are some of the sort of environmental implications that we're going to have to put in place that we're going to be even close to, 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 to meeting um, some of those, those targets. Um, so I think my plea, the plea of the trust is uh, we need to think again. There's lots of other things we need to put into our thought processes. <laughs> I actually don't need a 19th century solution, we need a 21st century solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Just to um, pick up on one point that Colin was saying about housing, the likely number of extra houses which will relate to the relief are about three or four thousand. And of course, Shrewsbury has been given a target by central government of about 8,000 houses in the next 20 years. And it's really scary. And, and the council has accepted the higher figure from central government that they needed to. And our next speaker from the campaign to protect rural England would know about that as well. And, and the other issue, of course, is that CPRE, of which I'm a member as well as Selby Martin is here, um, CPRE believes that the countryside should not be treated just as a disposable, uh, valueless asset. And that is the danger, of course, for things like building housing estates, roads, <coughs> airports, whatever. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the impacts, of course, are considerable. So I'll hand you over to Selby Martin, who is speaking on behalf of CPRE Shropshire. Selby is also well known for many of you, I'm sure. Selby?
Yes, I've been uh, involved with the countryside, Shropshire, and particularly Shrewsbury, for many years now. And um, uh, this development, the proposed relief road, is one which I consider to be of the utmost, um, uh, utmost importance to be opposed. Anyway, I'd like to begin with an explanation of this landscape which uh, Colin uh, showed in connection with wildlife. Uh, this is to do with, with landscape. And I ought to tell you how it came about. In 1998, the uh, Town Council, SABC, local plan, included areas of special landscape character based on the County Council structure plan. <laughs> Fine, you might think. But the inspector ruled that there was no survey material available uh, to justify these <coughs> proposed areas of special landscape character. Now, Shrewsbury CPRE in particular were unhappy with this, and we decided to undertake our own survey. <clears throat> it was organized by my colleague Roger Carlyle, who took it extremely seriously. He went on a week-long course on landscape um, assessment, landscape character assessment, to provide independent advice on, um, on future, for future developments. Uh, it was um, carried out over a three-year period. I think there were 66 different um, areas uh, which we studied, and um, Roger took photographs, two or three photographs for each area as evidence to show uh, what we were proposing. The um, guidance we had was a practical guide to landscape character assessment by the Countryside Agency in 2002. I brought with me a copy of the um, resulting um, survey report. If anybody's interested in, in seeing it, um, I have it here. It is, as you see, a very substantial document with several pages to each of the 66 areas. I should also mention that we had unstinting support from Shropshire uh, Council at the time, uh, both in the technicalities of producing the report, and then they <coughs> turned around and said, we'll print it for you, and they did. Whether they charged us for it, I think we did pay something for it, but uh, it was tremendous to have the uh, support of Shropshire Council. Now, um, The survey identifies 13 areas. These dark red ones are the highest category and notes that the proposed Northwest Relief Road, if built, would cut through four of these and adversely affect two others um, nearby. It commented, development within or adjacent to these areas would be extremely detrimental to the Shropshire landscape as a whole and to the setting and character of Shrewsbury. Wherever built, damage is bound to occur, uh, whether it be to hedgerows, streams, woodland, or whatever. But there are, I think in this case, two landscape areas of particular importance when considering the impact of the Northwest Relief Road. The first of these is the old riverbed. To any observer, I have the, ah, yeah, that's the, that shows the route um, at the top end. The next one, so this is the landscape of the, of the Northwest, of the, sorry, of the old riverbed. And anybody looking at it say, well, it's like any landscape in Shropshire. So why all the fuss? Well, the reason is that it is unique. It's rather as if 
One was looking at a Tala watercolour of somewhere in the country and had a very similar, almost identical um, copy of this by some amateur watercolourist. And of course, they're totally different. One is unique and commands a high price, the other one, nothing very in particular. Now, um, the, it is indeed a unique feature of our landscape, of the Shropshire landscape and particularly of the Shrewsbury landscape. Um, its origin, if I may just divert into this, its origin goes back a very long time um, when the River Severn was a much larger river than it is now, with more water in it. Uh, this was due to melting of the ice sheet um, to the north of us. And um, the effect of this, at one stage, possibly about 10,000 years ago, was to transfer silt from undermining the Shelton Rough area to the area just around the corner, um, where the, um, no, I think it's Gravel Bank Farm, and that blocked off the old route of the river and diverted it to where it is at present, which goes through the town. Sorry. Um, it's written up in this. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, it, have you got the right picture on? It's a, it's it's a very interesting story. And uh, one aspect, if I can talk uh, a bit longer, is that once this uh, old riverbed had been formed and it began to silt up, um, it deposited pollen from the surrounding landscape. And this has been researched um, by very thoroughly by the Montford um, Centre. And by looking at the pollen, you can work out a history of the surrounding area. So that, that is, it's now reckoned that all this happened about 5,000 years ago. Um, by, back in 1991, the Shropshire Council published a report by Paul Jepson on the area. Paul Jepson was a landscape consultant engaged by the town council to prepare landscape strategies. He recognised its importance, the riverbed, as uh, a local nature reserve to ensure its conservation and, and to quote him, this important and geomorphological and historical feature. He also proposed that it should be developed as a community resource for informal recreation and education in areas where this could not compromise the ecological value of the site. These aims were endorsed by both the Town Council and the County Council in 19, two, sorry, 2008, and the SABC's a green infrastructure um, strategy which stated the proposed Northwest Relief Road and the two sites identified for potential development may cause some environmental damage, but also present an opportunity to fund our developer contributions, um, a substantial program of habitat extension and creation. Uh, do you believe that? I don't. Any funds raised would be used in building the road. Shropshire Council's outdoor strategy uh, recognises its co uh, countryside quality and the fact that it is no near, so near to the town centre. And um, this uh, was encouraged by Paul Jepson, who proposed the introduction of footpaths. An obvious measure, no need for Northwest Relief Road to achieve this has been suggested in certain quarters. Uh, I walked along uh, the other day and um, it's easily accessible. There's an entrance to the, um, the, um, north, the um, county site, uh, agricultural site. Uh, you can park there, you can cross through an open gate and just walk along the route of the old, of the old river bed. In all fairness, however, it has to be uh, recognised that the present proposed route is less damaging than earlier versions. 
It starts from further away from the old river bed, and if built, would run north of the Hencote of the next one. There it is. You can see on that picture the Hencote Winery, which we objected to, incidentally, because it destroys part of the landscape and the view over the town. But um, it runs north of that Hencote Winery and Hencote Farm, and then follows a route uh, along fairly high ground going down uh, to fields uh, opposite Shelton Rock. Um, <clears throat> maybe, but an extensive area of adjoining land would quickly be developed for housing to raise funds for that section of the road, and any extensive development in the area would have damaging impact, but to a certain extent, <coughs> so far as this old riverbed goes, it could be worse. The same cannot be said for the Berwick estate. Move on. Yes. There you see the proposed bridge. Flat agricultural land is blighted by the proposed bridge over the River Severn, only a kilometre from the listed Berwick house. This is not a normal <coughs> stone bridge, which can be a positive feature in a country landscape. Um, the regulations governing the incline of a road approaching a change of height uh, between the fields on the, uh, on the north and the Shelton Rock on the south, a difference of, I made looking at the map, of about 23 metres, require a long and gradually higher embankment. It would have a dreadful impact on the whole area, including the landscape of Shelton Rock, which you see on the right-hand side of that picture, uh, um, a landscape which is admired by anybody, as I did before the the present boat came in, uh, which used to be able to go up. I think it was called the River Queen or the River King. And it would be, of course, destroyed by that bridge. Those in favour of the Northwest Relief Road could arrange, could argue that circumstances have changed and that the road is now needed. Yes, things have changed, mm -hmm. but the landscape has not. It remains that it has been for centuries and must be protected. The supposed benefits of the road cannot possibly justify the harm it would inflict on the landscapes of the area. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about the railway station and the bus station. I would have thought the Sorting um, office should be moved totally out, and we have a new bus station or two bus stations. But where the sorting office is, the buses and coaches, and you link it in to the train station so that you can have bus services which link in with trains. That's one thing, and the other thing is. Um, if you rewatered the Shrewsbury Newport Canal from the back of the Butter Market down to um, Shrewsbury Sports Centre, you, you could have a good cycle route, a good walking route, uh, which would be safe. It's already there. Uh, but I do understand the council do want to build on some uh, land. Is it Sundorn by the Croft? Cro 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 yeah. Uh, thank you for the point about crossing rail. I mean, the main thing is we don't have a system uh, or, or, or structure for integration anywhere in Britain. So there's no way to integrate the way people use buses and trains and want to swap from one to the other. And buses don't mean trains, trains don't mean buses, buses don't mean buses. The, the existing bus station is actually quite well located in terms of its access to a lot of things people want to get to, you know, shopping centres and and, uh, and various other things they do. And if there are uh, uh, possibilities for relocating it, I, I would advise caution on that. There's one thing that's been done, I don't know whether Chester still does run the little <coughs> runs around Chester. Mm -hmm. These have been tried in many parts of Britain, they work really well. 
you can actually meet a train with a little bus, electric bus, and you can run around, you know, the bus could run around and connect all the main destinations. So integration matters, and how you do it is, there are a lot of options for how you do it. I don't think moving the bus station in Shrewsbury uh, would be all that helpful. Also, you could improve walking, the pedestrian and cycling facilities. It's quite simple. It's done a lot in European cities. You can imagine, you need a good imagination for it. You, you, can, you can imagine a, a high quality two metre wide pedestrian link directly from the bus station to the main entrance of the train station. Right? Giving priority to pedestrians, giving pedestrian priority to the traffic flow. It's possible to do that. That happens in many places. So there's lots of ways of actually dealing with this, but the problem is. The, we, we have in Britain uniquely uh, sold out on integration. We're the only country in the world that makes cooperation between buses and buses and buses and trains illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and everywhere else in the world is regarded as intelligent. Okay, thank you very much. So my name is Dr. Julia Berkeley and I am the Labour candidate here, but I have a day job at Wolverhampton Council, which is a Labour run council. I do just want to challenge you if I may. So I think that it is currently illegal to subsidise buses and trains because they have to be run for profit. But you do find councils that choose to integrate. So I work at Wolverhampton and they integrate their bus and train service. As a funding officer there, I was told it was a political priority to bid for European money to create better cycle lanes. I was told to apply to the government the OLED fund, so we got two free electric buses exactly to do that, to run around the centre. And so first of all, you need the political will to do this, and then you need the mechanism through publicly funded transport. But there's something else, and it saddens me a bit that there's one poor chap here we wheeled out from the chamber and that everybody else here is probably against, because actually we're all in this together. And unless we get businesses on our side and find a way to support the local businesses in the centre of this town, unless we find a model that works for everybody, those businesses will suffer. They'll suffer with too much congestion and they'll suffer if nobody comes into town. So let's wise up and be realistic. We all are here because our heart is beating for the environment. But let's find a way to make it economically viable. I run European projects where we do just as the professor does, we exchange best practice. How does this succeed in other countries and other cities? They make it economically advantageous. In London, you pay a congestion charge if you want to drive. They've just brought that into Birmingham. In cities that we visited on our European project, they said, we are going to triple the cost of parking to make it undesirable. How many people in this room would choose to drive to the centre of Birmingham? God, you wouldn't. It would take you forever. It would cost you 20 quid to park there. So what do you do instead? You get on the train. So they priced you out of driving, and it works. So what we learned from those lessons are you use the planning structures. When you build new offices, houses, and shops, just like we saw, you do not build car parking. And with your existing parking, you sell the car park, and you use it for something else. The problem we have, as you very well know, is our Conservative Council have an economic model that depends on income from car parking. That could still continue. Instead of saying we want lots of people to have cheap parking, we'll say we'll let a few people pay a high price for parking and we'll offer free buses, subsidised buses and trains. How much does it cost to catch a bus across Shrewsbury? Who knows? £3.80, £4.20. It's outrageous. It's the same price for me to come from Bridge North to the centre and to go from one side to the other. Question. My question is, how can we join together? So instead of the core business chamber being ambushed by the environmental lobby, how can we join up with an economic model to decentivise people using their car and put an economic price on using cars? Okay, thank you. Can you want to say what and then lady over here? Yeah. Um, in, in Nottingham city centre, they've introduced a high um, workplace car parking fee. So any business has got its own car parking place, they've got a high fee on it. Businesses are supporting this <coughs> because they know that that money is being ring fenced to, to, to go to public transport. If it was just going <coughs> to council coffers, they would have fought against it. But they recognise that, 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 that that money is then going into better public transport, which is bringing more people into the city centre. So there are things you can do and the ways that you do it that, that can work, but also bring the businesses.
along as well. There's also a fact that, that actually it's found that, that, that people walking and cycling tend to spend as much shopping in the town centre uh, as people coming in cars. And in fact, people coming, people who are who are totally dependent on the car are much more likely to drive to an out-of-town <coughs> location or go to Telford. So what we need to do is to attract attract people on their bikes, on walking, on public transport, and getting them spending money in the town centre. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. Well, of course, I mean, we, we, we can all see clearly that the money spent on facilities for traffic is somewhat greater than the facilities for pedestrians <laughs> in town. There's no, we are looking at that as a civic society. My colleague here has done some thinking about the need to improve facilities for pedestrians in town, not just only for traffic. Yes, the lady there. <coughs> between the North West Road, Ellesmere Road, and the, and the lane to the primary would, would be built on if the road was built. That's sort of old news. They, the council have, done, have been working on their local plan review this year, and they actually had a meeting in this room where they, where they pulled up all the sites that were approved for this, this stage of the local plan. Those sites were not on there, because they haven't got approval, they're not recommended sites for this, for the coming, I forget what the years are. But if you go on their website, there is an evidence base behind that review of the local plan, and there's a map on there, and it includes all the sites that have been submitted. And all those sites up on that parcel of land around Henker are in that list. And two of them, say, no, we don't think this land should be developed. <coughs> but the rest of that whole area, including outside the road, which surprised me, not just inside, but <coughs> outside the road, were marked as not until the North West Road is built. Mm. So they're not in the current <coughs> phase, but if the road is built, they would definitely be, in the, they would definitely be uh, given priority in the next phase. Even the chunk of land outside the... the road, where other sites outside the road have been said, no, this is not suitable for development because we want to concentrate development within the loop. Mm -hmm. So most of that square, with Huffley Lane at the top, Ellesmere Road, and the winery at the bottom, is earmarked as potential for development of the road as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the, other area, the other aspect that needs to be thought about, of course, is the impact of building more and more houses mm -hmm. on hydrogeology. Because when you, once you build houses with hard surfaces, obviously the water, rainwater, which we seem to have more of these days, doesn't go into the soil. And of course, it's the same with roads. And um, I was interested the other day, I went on the walk, uh, the, the, the Better Public Transport group organised um, from Bigton. And there's a lot of agricultural land out there, so it's quite high. So I, and somebody was saying, well, of course, we're going to have to put the roads in culvert, in cuttings, 
And I was thinking, with all this rain, soon we'll have a canal system <laughs> in the north of Shrewsbury. <laughs> so we have a sustainable canal. Anyway, can I have another, there's time for another couple of questions. Yes, this gentleman. Yeah, um, I'm a bit lost in the facts here and the truth, if you think about this, because we've heard quite a lot of information being portrayed today, but actually um, the things that the council have come up with in the proposal, Chamber of Commerce have taken a view on, can understand that. We've had various views about how those figures are wrong, and then you throw climate change in on the top with a Centre for Alternative Technology saying there's likely to be a 40% reduction in traffic. That doesn't sound like a great I sense. There should be. There should be, or there may be. Who knows? We're at a tipping point, I think. I think it should be. Okay, it needs to be. But given that set of circumstances, the decision to go ahead or not with the road needs to be based on facts. So actually, there's a lot of noise in this. But actually, it doesn't feel like the facts have been truly established to make a decision at all. Good, good point. Anyone wish to add to that? Or any of my what the main point, please? Sorry? What was the main point? The main point, point is what the question all information is needed. The council's decision making needs to be made on, made on facts around include, and factoring in climate change. Okay, is that what you're saying? Yes. 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 Okay. Any further questions? We're going to finish in 10 minutes. I will offer you a comment on that. Yes, yes. Um, John? I've tried hard for 30 years, which is why I look nanny, to get, <laughs> to get councils to look at facts. It won't. They don't. <laughs> End of story. And it doesn't matter whether they're Labour, Lib Dem, or Conservative. They don't. There's a whole list of road schemes being supported by all those political parties. The, 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 the principal thing that we, we have to try and achieve is to change the whole way in which these projects are, uh, uh, they surface, they are discussed with independent organisations taking a view. So for example, on the, on the North West Road, uh, I have asked uh, councillors to take a view uh, on, on uh, a consultancy contract that will be relatively inexpensive, that will be a carbon audit. Mm -hmm. Exactly how much CO2, how much greenhouse gases, how much carbon would this road generate? There's the so-called embodied energy, which is all the concrete, all the steel, all the equipment, and 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 and, and. and then there's all the stuff about the forecast of traffic. And then at least we've got a factual basis. Right? So uh, so far, I don't even have a reply to that. So we, we need, we, I'm with you uh, on the call for facts, but we're, we're, we're such a long way from that the, at the moment in Shropshire. There is good news uh, in Herefordshire, uh, a particularly nasty road, uh, bypass around Hereford, has been, uh, the word they're using is paused, uh, but paused is better than it's going to get. Um, and the M4 relief road that Peter referred to in South Wales, which I was involved with for several years, has been cancelled. Now the model is there, and we can follow that model. So the Welsh Government, the Labour Welsh Government, that promoted this road for many years has decided it's a really bad idea, and they've set up a commission of inquiry. I've been asked and I've given evidence to it. What are all the things we can do to achieve all our objectives so the Chamber of Commerce and the businesses are involved? So it goes back to, to Julia's point. Uh, what are all the things we can do uh, to solve congestion, improve the local economy, deal with public health, deal with air pollution? The lot. The starting point makes it much easier. The starting point is no road. Right? And then that then <coughs> liberates all the kind of new thinking and creativity. So that's a model that we could use. And they've set up a commission, the Welsh Government, and they've invited a whole number of people to give evidence. They're collating all that evidence. And at the moment, I've not seen the it's, it's early days, I've not seen the output. That will provide us with a kind of a can I use the horrible expression roadmap? Yeah. That will that will provide us with a way of looking at these and that would apply Shropshire massively. Um, and I, I think I think it's very easy to be scathing about Shropshire Council as a body. Yeah. I think we need to remember that particularly, you know, there are different groups within the councillors, and a lot of the individual councillors have started to look at the facts, yeah. and a lot of them have, have come round to the point of view that it's not a good idea. Um, and um, our Green Councillor is certainly against it. The Lib Dems have come out against it recently, mostly, I believe, on, on risk, but also the effect of the environment. I don't know if Nat wants to add anything to that. The Labour, the Labour group have, have stated that they, they, they accept that things are changing and that they want to carry out a thorough review of the scheme in the new year. Um, 
And, and I'm certain a lot of the Tories are actually worried from the rural areas because they see money, money and effort all being poured into Shrewsbury rather than being spread around this county. I mean, it would be nice to have, you know, the, the 90 million total cost going on public transport in Shrewsbury. No, actually it wouldn't. It would be nice to have some of that in Shrewsbury and some of it going to Bridge North and Ludlow and Whitchurch and Oswestry Street and, and all the rest of it. So, you know, uh, I'm actually really hopeful in that situation. We've also got elections, <laughs> county elections coming up in only uh, less than 18 months' time, and the situation could easily change at that point, as it did in Hereford earlier this year. And, and I think we're in a very dynamic situation. Who could have guessed a year ago, we'd had this meeting a year ago, XR had no councils. If somebody had told me a year ago that Shropshire Council would have declared a climate emergency, <laughs> I, would, I, would have, I would have loved. <laughs> I, I still don't think that most people actually quite know what it means. But you know, things are happening and, and, and we're pushing hard to get the evidence across and get it fully debated. Thank you very much. Right, as we move into party politics briefly, to be, to be fair, and because it's a civic society organised event, I want to be balanced about this. We've had comments from the Labour side. I'd like to ask Nat Green if there's any decision on the part of the Liberal Democrats. And then Julian Dean, if there's any decision by the Green Party. Nat. Thanks, Byron. Yes, um, as you've already been told, the Liberal Democrats are opposing the Northwest Relief Road. And um, primarily, if I put my Shropshire Council hat on for the time being, that's because of financial risk to Shropshire Council. Um, that is the way the, the, the financing is structured, that the uh, central government is giving 54 million, but any cost overruns will go on top of the 17 million the Shropshire Council is meant to be, uh, meant to be finding. And have you ever found a large scale uh, construction project that came in on time and on budget? It doesn't happen. So, Shropshire Council is on board for that, and that is primarily why we're against it. But this is the, uh, the second point, and I would like to actually then put in as, as a question. Um, <coughs> obviously, the issue of the Perrick Road is, is, uh, is critical, and also the fact that the increased traffic coming down that road uh, is one that we should be very alarmed. Mm -hmm. And along with that is the air, increased air pollution that that will bring. And so, my question is are we able to quantify the increased pollution that that will bring because of the uh, because of the northwest relief road through berwick road and presumably down coton hill and probably up through town mm -hmm. i'm going to ask one of my colleagues who spoke earlier on about air pollution generally <coughs> do you want to say something about that uh, air pollution and the measuring of it and issues well, the fact is that our record for measuring air pollution in Shrewsbury, it's very vague and covered on, under clouds. Uh, for, for years, I had been trying to extract uh, specific details uh, about the air pollution in the town. And I was continuously being told, we're not ready yet, we're not ready yet. And not until we'll publish our final report. And then this report was never published, for somehow the need for it disappeared. Uh, so what I would suggest in answer to your question is the suggestion that Professor Whiteley made that he needs a small consultant's appointment to count the, uh, what did you call it, John, the carbon, carbon audit. I was referring to the greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. Yeah, okay, but it's part, it's part of the pollution array. And of course, the only other thing I would like to add about this pollution question is that, yes, Electric cars may reduce the carbon pollution and so on, but they still produce a big proportion of 
pollution through the tires. Tires are a big contributor to the microparticles which we breathe through pollution. So it does the problem doesn't disappear there. Thank you very much. Just on the AQ, is it under European law that a principal authority has to measure everyone and publish the data? So if they're not... It hasn't happened. Well, the first thing is freedom of information request, which requires them by law to release the data. And secondly, if it's really an exceedance, then there will be a fine past of government. So if, if what you're saying is true, then simply freedom of information yeah. Well, let, 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 let me add one thing to this. Initially, there were monitors on high streets near the square which have disappeared, have gone, uh, because they were placed in a location within the square which did not receive the wave of pollution which the cars along the highway bring. And therefore they thought, or they said, uh, it's not necessary because it doesn't record high pollution. Uh, the one in uh, uh, Jogpol, which was one of the highest locations for pollution uh, in the town centre, was also removed. They, they, they now have only one monitor in Chester Street. And uh, that isn't enough to give the full picture of what's happening in the town centre. So, so, yeah, but you, you, they can't be uh, fined for lack of information when they haven't got the monitors in the right place. Yes, comments on this before we leave the air pollution thing. First of all, it is complicated. There's lots of assumptions and lots of problems with modelling and lots of problems with monitoring. Uh, Cheshire East was recently caught out fiddling the numbers, for example. So a local authority has deliberately falsified their quality data. Uh, a number of us that work on traffic and environment and everything should think that's general. Right? I, I'm not accusing Shropshire because I don't know, uh, but there is, a, there is a fundamental problem. The, back to your question, the, the question about uh, we do need the data on air quality. Uh, it is grossly inadequate to choose, but grossly inadequate for reasons I don't fully understand. Uh, there are lots of independent consultancies that need to be brought in. It's not expensive, this. So we can watch it. King's College London, for example, a group of academics do this. They would look at the Northwest Road, they'd look at the traffic flows, they'd look at the various forecasts, they'd look at the mix of vehicles, they'd look at the proportion of electric vehicles and fossil fuel vehicles, and they look at other speeds, and they look at congestion levels, they look at two electric junctions, look at the phasing of traffic lights. That's why it's complicated. And they come out with an answer. But we don't have that information, and I think we should. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Right, we, we, we've moved on to the party political views, and to be fair, um, I must ask Julian Dean. Yes. Thank you, I'll be quick. Yes. So, yeah, uh, well, you can ask a question, Julian. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to be surprised if Green Party's always been against the Northwest Relief Road for all these reasons. I just want to touch on the economics, the sort of the, uh, business case, if you like, and, and the prompt question on that, which is that. Really, if we're going to talk about the economic impact, we need to think about the type of growth that we want, the type of growth which can be sustainable. And to me, that's a lot of that is actually about bringing people into the town, but bringing people into the town who actually don't really have very good access to the town now. And so that then leads on to the question, which is about, e about inclusivity. We know that half the people who live in social housing don't have a car. We know that many single pensioners don't have a car. We know that even in households where there is a car, it's only the bloke who gets the car keys. So there are lots of issues around social inclusivity, which I think would, would be a useful part of this story. It would also be a useful part of the way we think about the economic growth that the town does need, but which can be sustainable, and which is about including people who currently can't get in. And just finally, just then I have to tell the story about the lovely people of the Shropshire Council. You know, it's about mindset. So when I talk to him about roads in this area, which is what I'm in council for, when I'm talking about it, I'm thinking about road safety, and I'm thinking about questions. And he says, I oh, know the roads in your area are great. I drive through your area quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, so it's a mindset yes. thing. I do think it's about shifting the way now. So, so Peter's contribution when he was talking about that mobile shift and, and making, making the, the town accessible in other ways, it's about giving people the choice to leave the car at home. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, 
Does anyone like to speak on behalf of Daniel Kaczynski? <laughs> <laughs> so we have absolute balance. We've heard, we've heard uh, no, three parties. <laughs> there is, there is a, a letter, actually, Daniel Kaczynski wrote some time ago about this. Giving, he takes the credit, of course, if it is um, publicity material, for raising the 54 million. And he says the proposed road would also cut the journey time between the north and the west by two thirds. This would lead to more efficient car journeys, less congestion, and lower pollution. The cost benefit ratio in previous studies has suggested a multiplier rate of 5.4, which can be seen as good value for money based on the government's criteria. I know from preliminary findings it's a very worthy scheme which I will be doing all I can in Parliament to pro pro progress. I thought it was important to have that perspective as well. Okay, uh, right, we need to think. Yes? I'm just saying, like in terms of balance, I'm actually a Conservative councillor. Ah, so you can speak yes. on behalf but of anybody? No, no, I'm not here to speak on behalf of anybody. I'm just here as a councillor and I'm here to keep an open mind. And I'm also, I have right. my business in the town centre. So I don't actually have a question, I'd just like to say I am here, we are represented, and I'm very interested in what I've got to say. Right, I'd like to, just, before we finish, I'd like to introduce Bibbs Cameron to you. Bibbs is the membership secretary of the Civic Society and has done a lot to organise today. So I'd like to thank her very much on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. and make our voice louder. We do like to put on these conferences to educate the public about certain topics in the town. And without that loud voice, we're not able to do it. So uh, consider joining us. The membership form is on your seat. And at the same time, I would like to thank our cameraman, Chris Davenport, who has um, taken a film of the proceedings which can be seen on YouTube and our photographer Bill Tomaszewski who has taken photographs for the Civic Society. Thank you. Could I have a question before we finish? Could I just say? I've come up from Hereford today, and the parallels between the arguments for the exit through and the ones we're going through are amazing, what you say. Yeah, it had huge political influence, didn't it, in Hereford? Uh, I've, I've got two comments. Please don't let yourself go down too many rat holes in the arguments that come and go. I've heard two things that are simply not true. Suddenly one of them from you, Chen, was about national housing targets. The only national housing target is something like 200,000 houses to be built a year across the country. Where they go, when the show's built, um, Shropshire takes a number, is largely in the hands of its own politicians. And the second one was from our business rep, who, I have to say, sir, you did really well, I've <laughs> a very sticky wicket, was about this, this really silly idea of keeping hold of our young people. Think about it. Shrewsbury Shropshire's finders do not go around with a badge on them. They are not monitored in and out of the place. When I ran the research team in Herefordshire, we did a study and very, very few places actually gain young people. London does in droves. University cities like Nottingham, Edinburgh, Oxford and Cambridge actually show they get more young people than the actual population reduces. Everywhere else tends to lose them. And some will come back, but they may not be short to the own. So please don't go down the line of saying, we have to do this to bring more of our young people back. Some young people will come back, they may not be your own. Okay. I'm very quick to say, I've been a member of the Civic Society since 1968. This is one of the best debates that I can ever remember in organizing. 
and I would, I would like to thank you very much indeed for oh, making it available. Okay. Thank you. All of you for coming along today. It's been a fascinating day, very interesting. For somebody who hasn't made up their mind, hopefully it will, it, it, it will help them in that direction. I'd also, of course, like to thank my speakers for their excellent presentations this afternoon. So, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.